in the front. So our session here, the Ocean of Churn, with Sanjeev Sanyal in conversation with Sunil Kilnani. I'll tell you a little bit about Sunil Kilnani. He is currently Awanta Professor and Director of India Institute at the King's College London. He has been a Fellow of Christ College, Cambridge, the Woodrow Wilson Center, Washington, D.C., the Institute for Advanced Study in Berlin, and the American Academy in Berlin. He is the author of The Idea of India, and most recently, Incarnations, A History of India in 50 Lives. So here we have Sunil Kil Kilnani in conversation with, actually it's the other way around, it's Sanjeev Sanyal in conversation with Sunil Kilnani. So let's welcome <laughs> Sanjeev Sanyal and Sunil Kilnani. Thank you for that introduction and welcome to what I think might be one of the most exclusive uh, <laughs> sessions at the Jaipur Festival this year. It's clearly um, uh, only very few who've been allowed into this session. So we're uh, you'll have to be louder. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. No, I was just welcoming you, you to what I think might be one of the most exclusive sessions here at Jaipur. It's a real pleasure to um, be having this conversation this morning with Sanjeev Sanyal. Um, Sanjeev is a, 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 a finance person, an economist by training uh, and also by profession, but he's also a writer of some very interesting works of history. Um, he wrote a book some years ago about the rivers of India, and his most recent book that we're going to be talking about today is the, called The Ocean of Churn, How the Indian Ocean Shaped Human History. And I think it's, it's part of... Um, something interesting that's going on in the writing of Indian history that's been happening over the last few years, which is that many of the conventional approaches that have dominated the writing of Indian history, the dominance of particular political approaches, of Marxism, the dominance of social history, um, and the dominance of nationalist history, all seem to be um, on the wane and we've seen, I think, the, the emergence of a, a different set of questions that historians are now asking about the Indian past. Um, a move away into territories and areas that haven't really been covered. So um, the, the move away from the study of India through large collective categories like religion or caste into more individuated approaches. My own uh, uh, attempt recently to look at Indian history through, through 50 individuals, um, and in a variety of different ways. And I think what, what Sanjeev has been doing and what he's done very effectively with this book, his new book, is really to swivel around um, how we think about India and its relationship to, to, to its past and to the world. That's to say, we've always thought about or generally tend to think about Indian history through the perspective of, a, of, of if you like, a continental viewpoint. Um, India as a landmass uh, to which others have come, uh, and indeed, uh, most importantly, to which Western powers have come and done things. And I think what Sanjeev is, is, is posing for us in this book and, and getting us to think about is India more as a peninsula that uh, uh, juts into the ocean and where the, it's, it's the oceanic connections, uh, the maritime relations, which have really shaped not just India, but the history of all the surrounding um, uh, societies and civilizations around the rim of ocean. So it really opens up a very different set of questions 
for us. And I thought what we'd do, we'd start by doing, Sanjeev, if, if, if you could, is just if you can set out for us what some of the broad themes and arguments in the book are, and what you think it's, what are some of the most striking arguments that you feel uh, you want to highlight for us as readers? So, of course, this is not the first book that's been written about the Indian Ocean. Um, the other books have been written. Um, but they tend to have what I would call the Western sin and the Eastern sin. So the Western sin is that, um, and this, this applies to the bulk of what is written about the Indian Ocean, is that essentially the story of the Indian Ocean is written from the perspective of uh, Western colonization. So essentially, uh, you know, history gets going when Vasco da Gama turns up in the Indian Ocean. And yes, there was some sort of a history before that, but it's all kind of squished together in a perfunctory chapter on spice trade, as if people in this region were sitting around growing spices, uh, waiting for the Portuguese to turn up. And of course, it ends with them, uh, with, uh, them leaving. Uh, so the history almost ends with uh, the colonial powers going back. So you hardly hear about, say, the rise of Singapore or, um, you know, uh, Nelson Mandela and so on. Uh, but even when you do have more recent histories, you have people like Robert Kaplan who writes book, book Monsoon, but then he's talking about it, you know, the future of American power, as if um, the population living in this part of the world are sort of pawns in that game, which has nothing to do with themselves, but, you know, uh, it's the outsiders uh, that really matter to it. So that is, that is one major problem with uh, history writing of the maritime history of the Indian Ocean. The, the second problem, which I call the Eastern sin, now of course you will argue that you know, in, you know, India and other countries of this region have been free now for some uh, 70 odd years and um, you know, enough time to have written our own history. Uh, and indeed, many countries have written uh, hi their own histories. Um, and um, you, you discovered the problems with ideology and of course, Indian history writing has all kinds of problems with layers of bias, so there's the colonial biases, Nehruvian biases, Marxist biases, and so on. But there is one major bias that is very often simply forgotten, which is that the story of India is told almost from the perspective of Delhi. Continental, but particularly from Delhi. So you'll hear, you know, textbooks, for example, will teach you about obscure dynasties like the Lodhis, but will basically leave out, you know, major empires like the Satvahanas or the Cholas and so on. Um, and even when they do talk about them, it is talked in isolation, as if they did not have great linkages through to other parts of the Indian Ocean world. So, yes, you will, you know, if you're growing up in Tamil Nadu, you'll definitely hear about the Cholas. And you'll be told, you know, at some point in the 11th century, the Cholas did these raids on Southeast Asia. But you'll never be told why they did it. Uh, what were the links, what was the politics or geopolitics of the time? What were the influences going back and forth? So. This isolationist view, and particularly continental view of um, history, uh, is the second problem. So what I've attempted to do in this particular book is try and tell the story more from the interlinkages mm. and from the perspective of the coasts. Mm. Um, as you say, there have been a number of, uh, in recent years, a number of studies about the ocean. There's Sunil Amrit's book on the, the Bay of Bengal, um, Sugata Bose has also done a book. H how would you distinguish your own arguments from the kind of work that they have been doing? Um, so one of the things I try to do is, of course, the interlinkages over uh, space, which, is, mm -hmm. which some of them also do, but also over time. So um, m most of their work is much more fixed to a certain time frame, whereas, as you will have noticed, I literally start with human beings coming out of Africa yeah. and colonizing the world, and end, the book ends basically with the death of Lee Kuan Yew. So taking vast time in space. So what I'm trying, trying very hard to do is to show how things are interconnected over space and time and how they continue to influence us in multiple ways. I mean, I live in Singapore. Singapore literally means Singapura, lion city. It's a Sanskrit word, uh, but it's in Southeast Asia. So it's not something that happened a long time ago. It has an influence in how we think of many things even today. I mean, on that point, you know, we, we, in India we often um, <clears throat> uh, celebrate the, the, the fact or, or uh, admire the fact that, you know, I Indian and Sanskrit civilization 
did spread uh, certainly into Southeast Asia and into other parts, uh, uh, Western Asia to some extent as well. But one of the things that um, is interesting in, in your book is you talk also about how uh, the, these areas like the Southeast Asia have in turn influenced India as well. That's something that gets less attention, I think, and less, less consideration. So uh, can you give us some examples of the way in which connections with Southeast Asia um, uh, actually have influenced and affected life and practices in India? So in multiple <laughs> ways. I mean, um, I talk about in this book um, about, you know, from a very early period in Neolithic migrations from Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. land migrations coming through and uh, filtering through to much of Eastern India. So many of the people there have very close genetic and linguistic links with Cambodians um, in uh, Northeastern India. Uh, but even later, uh, you know, Indians are very proud of say Nalanda University. And they say, you know, people from all over the world came there to study. Uh, what is often forgotten is that Nalanda University was actually partly funded by the Srivijaya kings of Sumatra. Mm -hmm. Similarly, um, you know, the custom of eating pan. Now, the supari is actually a Southeast Asian fruit or plant. So these things have been going back and forth. In fact, my book literally starts with the story of Nandi Varman II. Mm -hmm. So here we are in the ninth century, and there's a crisis in the Pallava kingdom because they're, they're, the main line, the male line has died out. Mm. Um, and they are now very scared that the Chalukyas will come and take over the Pallava kingdom. When somebody remembers that some hundred odd years ago, uh, a Pallava prince had gone off to Southeast Asia uh, and had married a local princess and stayed on. And somebody says that maybe there is a descendant from that and we can bring him back to rule uh, the Pallava kingdom. So a delegation goes off to somewhere in Southeast Asia and there's some dispute exactly where. But um, they find the descendant of Bhima, who is the prince who had gone off, and he has four sons. And the first three sons are asked if they would want to go back and become the king of the Pallava uh, empire. And they refuse, but the youngest son, who is just 12 years old, or 10 years old in fact, um, says, yeah, I'll take the, take the plunge, and he sails back, and he comes back, he is crowned, he fights off the Chalukyas and other, other uh, 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 claimants, and goes on to become Nandi Varman II, one of the greatest um, kings of southern India. But the fact is, he is either Malay or Cambodian, depending on how you think about it, and if you go and see some of his temples, you can clearly see the influence of Southeast Asia. In fact, many of the faces on the temple walls are clearly not uh, locals. Mm. Um, so again, the point being made is that this interchange and interaction has been going on for a very, very long time. Mm. Well, let me ask the question that I think puzzles many of us, which, which you know, India has this vast coastline. Uh, there have been these connections uh, uh, across the, the oceans running back many centuries. But why, why did India, or parts of India, that's be, to be more specific, never really develop a substantial maritime presence and power? I mean, certainly the Indian Ocean was a, was a space of interconnections of others traveling across, of east and west. You mean militarily? West. Militarily or even in terms of a cargo capacity. I mean, Indian ships, uh, Indian the development of maritime technology in India was not really something that, 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 that could rival uh, its development elsewhere. And why do you think that somehow that, that didn't really happen, even though there were these smaller expeditions, there were these moments of connection, there was a recognition of the importance of the oceans, and yet both from a military and naval point of view and also for, from a substantial shipping and cargo point of view, um, none of the Indian uh, uh, kingdoms really developed uh, a powerful so I would See, dispute that in the sense that this is true maybe after the 12th, 13th century. Mm -hmm. Before that, actually, Indian shipping was considered very, very good. In fact, they developed a shipping uh, design called the stitch ship, which you may have heard of, mm -hmm. uh, which is a very peculiar design because even though India, in fact, iron technology and steel technology was possibly invented in India, 
Uh, Indians, for some reason, when they went for uh, shipbuilding used to use a stitched technique for building these ships and many, many uh, people, uh, there's lots of evidence of it. It's uh -huh. still not a dead technique, it's still used in yeah. some places. Um, and this technolo technology was very interesting because um, it allowed them to sh uh, sail around in areas where there were lots of shoals and sandbars and so on because the allowed the, sh the hull to be flexible. Uh -huh. So if you have a stiff hull made, which is hammered on a frame, if you hit a sandbar, it basically breaks up very quickly. Mm. So this technology had a huge advantage and it could, in fact, the Arabs also adopted it, uh, the Omanis in particular. And so there was a fair amount of, a huge amount of shipping going between the Indians and the Romans, Indians in Southeast Asia. In fact, there were Indian merchant colonies all the way up the coast of the Chinese and their, you know, South Indian style temple remains all along mm. the way. So there's plenty of this uh, happening. The problem was that um, at some point in time, this technology became a problem. Particularly, um, it was first superseded by the Chinese in the, in the 1400s, where clearly Admiral Zheng He and his junks were a completely different scale. Uh, and then with the arrival of the Europeans, because um, the European ships uh, could take the blowback from cannon fire, mm -hmm. whereas the stitch ship techno technique, uh, while it had certain advantages, uh, simply couldn't take cannonry, not in terms of getting hit by one, which was, would be bad too, mm. but if you put a cannon in some of these strip ships, they got warped. So consequently, that technology uh, became a real problem. So it, it, it may have actually retarded the adoption of cannon uh, 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 technology mm -hmm. into Indian naval, but point taken that at some point in time, we distinctly fell behind and mm. Although the Marathas and others did develop, uh, you know, coastal naval capability, real trans-oceanic capability um, did go into mm. decline. But so the the Europeans, of course, come arrive in India uh, as explorers and also as traders. The Chinese, as you say, set off these missions of exploration and trade. Um, the, the, that curiosity of exploration. Uh, which d drove many of the, the Western expeditions and the Chinese expeditions. Do you find a similar or any evidence in, in, in the work you've done of um, Indians going off to explore Absolutely. different parts? Yes, of in fact, the ocean there is lots of great legends about this. Mm -hmm. Now, because they happened such a long time ago, we can't be dead sure that they are exactly true, but there are plenty of legends in Southeast Asia about Indians doing things. And I'll give you the story of Kondinya. Mm -hmm. So, if you go to Southeast Asia uh, and you look at um, uh, whether you go to southern Vietnam with the Chums mm -hmm. or the Angkors, they, you'll find this legend inscribed in many places. And in fact, even the Chinese mention it in there. And the story goes somewhat as follows. There are various versions, but this is basically the version that somewhere in the second, third, fourth century BC, there was a, a uh, Indian merchant ship sailing along the Mekong Delta. Mm. And um, on board was this uh, very handsome uh, Brahmin called Kondinya. Mm. Uh, and they were attacked by pirates. And K Kondinya sort of got his crew together and fought the pirates off. But unfortunately, as a result, his ship had been damaged and they had to take it onto the shore and uh, to try and repair it. Um, so when they were doing this, they were suddenly found themselves surrounded by the local tribe, which they call them the Naga tribe. So the Naga tribe somewhere in, you know, Mekong Delta surrounded them and things looked quite dire. When Kondanya again organized his crew and they were going to defend themselves to death. Um, and, you know, things were looking uh, quite bad when um, the leader of the Naga tribe who had surrounded them who was, by the way, a young warrior princess called Soma, mm. saw Kondinya and fell in love. And she um, proposed marriage. Now, Kondinya, of course, I suppose at this point didn't have too much choice about the matter. So he agreed to marry her. And they married and they set up a dynasty. Uh, interestingly, a matrilineal dynasty, mm. which um, shows through uh, in much later times, even a thousand years later, when the Angkor and all these kingdoms are at their height, they still go and try and show their lineage back to this marriage between Kondinya and Soma. 
Now, we can't be sure that this legend is exactly true, uh, but there are some interesting things about it which, are, uh, which suggest that, you know, at least part of it may be true. Um, it is, uh, one, true the case that Indian civilization did go to southern Vietnam very early on, right. much further than it went, uh, much earlier than it went to Indonesia. But also, uh, take Kondinya, the name. Um, it is not a common first name, but it is a common gotra. And this gotra, interestingly, is found in, uh, in a stretch which basically goes from northern Tamil Nadu hmm. along the coast of uh, Andhra to southern uh, Orissa. Exactly the parts of the country from where hmm. these voyagers were going out. We have, again, lots of uh, legends and festivals, even to this day, related to oceanic travel in that uh, yeah. zone. So the point I'm making is there, yes, there is men, memory of this in mm -hmm. multiple ways. Mm -hmm. so, again, one of the, the conventional stories we tell ourselves about uh, India's sort of maritime connections is that you know, it was essentially a peaceful connection, that, that Indians' influence spread through Southeast Asia. But I think there's some very striking examples uh, that contradict that. I mean, Raja Raja Chola would be yes. you know, a clear example where this was a, uh, a, a ruler and, and, and his son indeed, um, where marauding and uh, you know, the invasion of Sri Lanka, for instance, yes. uh, which involved a huge amount of violence and pillage. Um, and I think, I think it's also important, and, 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 and you know, your, your book you know, brings this out, and uh, the, 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 the aggression sometimes that was shown, um, and it was certainly not peaceful or, or, or for, for you know, trading purposes. It was basically to ransack rich kingdoms uh, well, and bring the wealth back, and it's, it's there something are that, many exa you know, many examples, and there are uh, many things going on. So you mentioned Rajendra Chola, for example, yeah, and he made this right. made this very very famous raid on uh, the Sri Vijaya and yeah. sacked all the ports there. And so the context of that is very interesting because we think of geopolitics as being something modern, but in fact, what is going on? If you if you look at the Chinese and Southeast yeah. Asian, particularly the Chinese records, you get a different impression. So what is going on, and this is my interpretation from looking at the facts uh, which I've collected at different places, is that around about the, the beginning of the um, 11th century, world trade was basically uh, driven by trade between Fatimid Egypt, Chola India, southern India, and the Song Empire in China. So that was the trade going back and forth, and there was a huge amount of evidence of in, including Indian shipping going back and forth. Now, there were two bottlenecks in this, and the two bottlenecks was the, so you could either go to China from India through the Malacca Straits, that is between Sumatra and the Malay, Malaysian Peninsula, or you could go through the Sunda Strait, which is between Java and Sumatra. And typically, the Sumatrans, the Srivaja, used to control the Malaccan Strait, and the Javans used to control the Sunda Strait. Now, in the beginning of the 11th century, around about 1016 or so, what happened is that the Sumatrans and the Chinese entered into a coalition. Uh, and with Chinese backing, the Sumatrans knocked out the Javanese from the Sunda Straits. Mm. Now, this meant that they controlled both the trade routes and began to impose high tariffs. Now, this is what basically uh, uh, got wound up Rajendra Chola. And he, he sends one yeah. warning uh, uh, mission um, which does a raid and comes back, but then he sends a much larger one later, which sets off from Nagapatnam, mm -hmm. does a series of raids along the Malacca Straits, and then ultimately defeats the Sri Vijaya Empire in Kida, in northern Malaysia, what was then called Kadaram, mm -hmm. and then comes back. Uh, and after that, uh, the, the uh, routes uh, open up again. But it was also interesting what the Chinese did in response to this. The Chinese absolutely did nothing, suggesting that while they, uh, the Chinese were backing their ally, um, there was perhaps some sort of an understanding between the Cholas and the Song um, about uh, clearing up these trade routes, because just a little bit later, you have both the Sri Vijaya and the Cholas sending a joint mission mm, yeah. to the court uh, in, China, in Beijing, suggesting that, uh, not Beijing, it was in uh, some other place at that time, um, uh, and you know, meeting the Chinese emperor. Mm. So 
these kinds of things have been going on for a long time. But of course, Indians do not only go there as empires, etc. There's lots of evidence of Indian mercenaries all over the yeah. Indian Ocean. So it's not always Indian powers based in India that are are being, uh, the, you know, Indians quite separately uh, spread across, and uh, they were prized in the Middle East as mercenaries. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think I think that that's a, a, a important. I mean, one of the the the, the stories that I write about in, in my own book, in Incarnations, is about the, the, the journey of Malik Amber from Ethiopia via yes. the Gulf to the Deccan. Um, and he comes as an Ethiopian slave and then co goes on to become a you know, power broker in the Deccan. And I think that's one aspect that as historians, uh, there's a lot more work that could be done. That's to say on the slave trade, not from Africa to the Americas, which is the usual story that's told, but from Africa to India as to well. India in and, fact, they're, and they're, Southeast they're, Asia. Uh, I think that, that there's a lot more that we need to fact, know about In fact, their descendants that. are still around. They're called the CBs. Of course, of course. In, um, in, in Gujarat and in Hyderabad. Yeah, and they came and, as yeah. not just as slaves. Of course, you mentioned Malik Ambar who moved up and became a general and so on. Mm. Uh, but they also came as pirates. Uh, yeah. So, yeah. for example, if you go to Murur Janjira, just south of Bombay, yes, been, and yes. that, that was a, they were Abyssinian pirates. Yeah. And of course, when you're talking about slave trade, it's not just inward, there's also outward. outward the Portuguese yeah. uh, were a horrible lot. I mean, their history in the Indian Ocean is absolutely uh, no better than that of the Mongols in, the, uh, in Central Asia. Uh, they just behaved utterly badly. And uh, they were bringing slaves in, but they were also uh, raiding the coast's mm. line, especially the western coastline, capturing slaves from there and trading them uh, through to the Spanish, mm. interestingly, in Manila, who then took these slaves on to um, uh, Mexico. Mm. So that, and there are, uh, there are very uh, well-known individuals, there was a, a lady called, a girl, young girl called Mira, who was captured from somewhere along the west coast went through this, through the Manila slave route, uh, ended up in um, Mexico, and then um, was venerated by the locals as some sort of a saint. Uh, and of course, the Roman Catholic Church totally didn't like her, uh, tried to suppress her veneration, but her shrine still exists today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, those are fantastic stories to explore. Uh, another aspect that, that interests me um, uh, is the way in which the, Oceanic connections actually kept India very open as a so yes. society. I mean, um, you talk about the Vijayanagara Empire, and I, I also write about Krishna Deva in, 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 in incarnations. And, and one of the, 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 the points there is that this was an empire that was very open to yes. trade connections and, and mercenary connections and so on. And, and, and actually, you know, the, the story that's often portrayed of the Vijayanagar Empire as being a kind of resistor to uh, Muslim rule and so on, in fact, it's much more complicated. Uh, it had very strong trading relations with, with the Gulf, with Arab traders. Um, it, it had, it, it, indeed, within the, their own subjects, Krishna Devaraya was seen as the ruler of Muslims. And, and I think this, these oceanic connections help to complicate some of the standard uh, portrayals. So my uh, view is uh, both are true. I mean, the uh, Vijayanagar Empire consciously thought of themselves as resistance to Turkic invasions. That is true. Also true that they had links with the Portuguese and the um, uh, Arabs and traded with them. And, uh, with, and with Bijapur rulers. And, 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 yes, and they, they were continuously yeah. fighting them. Yeah, but fighting. They, were, they were also in alliances with one against the other. Yeah. But it's also true that in the end, they all ganged up and destroyed Vijayanagar. So I think uh, y y you cannot take one and not the other. The, the, the Vijayanagar very consciously, right from the beginning, thought of itself as uh, sort of Hindu resistance to the Turkic but invasion. What you also but, see but the other thing is also true. Mm. And what you see is that Vijay Vijayanagar was really one could say a cosmopolitan city. Uh, yes, it was it the had world's people from all over. If you look at the sculptural motifs, you yeah, see absolutely. headdress, clothes, yes. etc. So, uh, so it was. It was not just cosmopolitan. It was mm. massive. Mm. Um, uh, it was the world's largest city at the point it was destroyed. Mm. Uh, it had over a million people. Uh, if you visit Hampi, please do. It's one of the great uh, uh, sites in the world. 
uh, at least comparable, uh, if not larger than Angkor Wat, mm. uh, that people go to see. Yeah. And, but I think the important point is we think of Hampi as being very much this land-bound, enclosed capital. Now it's not. And actually it's the connections it had yeah, uh, it was inland through the for, oceans. It was inland for uh, defense reasons. Mm. Yeah. Uh, because remember, they were, they, they, they were defending themselves against Turkic cavalry, which mm. was the big problem, mm. but also against um, Portuguese cannons. So if you go to uh, Vijayanagar or Hampi, you will see why they built it there. It, it has the Tungabhadra Absolutely. along on one side, but it has this very strange landscape of rock outcrops. Mm. And the reason you want to build a city in such a landscape is because it breaks it up in a certain way, which, which, which is defense against Turkic charge, mm. uh, cavalry charges, and is a huge advantage to uh, heavy uh, infantry. Mm. So there was a reason why they built it where sure. they did. Uh, but point taken that, uh, you know, their economy was, in, you know, very heavily maritime. In do telling these kind of histories, um, I mean, one of the challenges is sources. And when you were uh, doing this work, what kind of sources uh, were you able to draw upon or do you, th or, or do you feel are beginning to become available now that make this work? more doable, if you like. So it depends which bit of history you're looking at. So mm. if you take the early part of my book, um, I heavily depend on genetic studies which are coming out in the last five, six years. There's a lot of interesting stuff about where, who migrated where at which point in time. So I've used a lot of that uh, material. There's a lot of stuff on climate change uh, through time, mm -hmm. and they have had enormous influences of how people have moved around. So if you take the early part, um, a lot of the archaeology, genetics, th those kind of stuff, uh, a lot of it is very, very new. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there are relatively few books uh, that have begun to incorporate this uh, systematically. Uh, then when I go into the later periods, um, obviously I take more conventional uh, texts, uh, inscriptions and so on. Um, uh, but one of the things I do insist on doing, to the extent possible, I try and visit all the locations. Yeah. Uh, and I think that's very, very important because unless you go and see some of these places physically and then try and imagine what those places may have been like, uh, you cannot tell the story. And I'll give you one example. Um, you know, if you just read about Dholavira, uh, the Harappan site, mm. and, and uh, never visited it, uh, you would never guess by looking at a map that it is actually a port. Mm. But if you go to Dholavira, it's blatantly obvious that it's a port because it's on an island surrounded by these massive white salt flats. Mm. Now, if you look at a map, it's far inland. It's, uh, you know, uh, it's in the run of Kutch. It's far inland. But when you go there, you can see that at some point in time, this was an island surrounded by an estuary. And it's blatantly obvious when you see it. And, um, and the reason it was there was because it was the estuary of both the Indus and the Saraswati River flowing into this. And it would have looked not dissimilar to the Sundarbans. Mm. And then it begins to dry up. And ultimately, it completely dries up. And tectonics causes that area to rise. So the sea also flow gets drained off. And that place dries up into the, the bizarre landscape of the run of Kutch that you see. But if you haven't visited it and thought about its climate, climatic change, uh, then you would not catch on to the fact that why would you want to build a large city in pretty much the middle of nowhere and now really hot, dry desert. Um, so one of the things I do try very hard to do is to visit um, as many of the locations as possible. And of course, as you come to more recent history, there is much more contemporary stuff. The very last bit of my book, some of it is my personal experience of the evolution of Bombay, for example. Mm. Yeah, no, I, I, I entirely agree with that. I think actually seeing the physical locations introduces a whole other dimension. I wonder, should we take some questions from the audience and then we can perhaps come yeah. back to our conversation as well. Yes. Uh, yeah, why don't we take, yes, your, yes. Hi. Um, my question is, I've read your book, uh, very good, and my question is that uh, in, in your book, you have tried to move things away from Delhi. Yes. And into the hinterlands of the sub Coasts. In yeah, this and the coasts. Book. Now, after reading your book, I happened to travel to Vishnupur, 
you know, which is in Bengal. Yes. And I was surprised to learn that the kings there ruled for 900 years. The Mal Malla dynasty. The Malla Bhum dynasty. Yes. You know, the Malla dynasty. Now, and they must have thrived by their, you know, using the ports of Tamluk and the others mm. that has been happening there. Now, that set off an interesting thought in me that there must be these regional histories which have, we have never really read, mm. we don't really know. Hmm. Is there any effort that you are going to put in to, you know, bring these so, histories to life, you know? So, that's, that is part of what I'm attempting to do. Obviously, the book has to be readable, but I've collected tons of stories which I have not put in my book because it would have become unreadable. Uh, in that specific case, um, one needs to be a little careful of using the kings of Bishnupur in a maritime sense. Because by the time they arrived, the port of Tamluk had already uh, died out. Tamralipti was no longer in existence. Tamralipti died out before 1000 AD, and these people came in at 12, 1300. So there isn't too much of the history of uh, Birbhum, that area, and maritime. Maybe there is, but it's not particularly strong. But point taken about local histories, yeah, absolutely. So I'll give you one example of a very strong local history which I've talked about in my book, which has basically been wiped out of memory uh, except locally. You know, there were a series of these three warrior queens in a place called Ullal near Mangalore, the Queen's Abakka. Um, and they are very, very strongly remembered in local culture. For three generations, they kept up a resistance against the Portuguese. And if you look at the Akshagana and other things, they are, they are there everywhere in local and there, the Portuguese have left, uh, you know, some writings about their interactions with this lady or these series of ladies. Uh, but uh, interestingly, you will, there, I could not actually find a proper book, at least in English. I believe they exist in Tulu, which is the local language. But I could not find a single good book on uh, these queens in English. Um, so it's, you know, it's going to your point that these histories have just been left to die, so to speak. Uh, the same thing is true, uh, till relatively recently people did not think about why the, the most important Uriya festival of Kartik Purnima, why it was celebrated in this particular peculiar way that, uh, you know, early in the morning on this particular day in November, uh, particularly the women and the children go to a water body and put a small paper boat uh, with a lamp in it. Uh, it's now understood, the reason for that is very simple, because this is the time in November when this happens, when the winds shift from blowing south to north, from north to south. And so basically this was the point in time when the Odia merchants used to set sail uh, for Southeast Asia. And you still have uh, a fest very important festival in Katak called Bali Yatra, which means, literally means the journey to Bali. So there are all these local histories that are still there, uh, if you just dig for it, I mean, similarly, the southern um, Tamil Nadu, uh, you know, there is a, po a city called Nagapatnam. Uh, it's still called Nagapatnam. There is st still a port there, but it was the main port of the Cholas. And why is it called Nagapatnam? Because that is the word very often used in Sanskrit literature for people who have oriental features. In fact, even now we have Nagaland in an indirect way because of this reason. <coughs> so. Why Nagapatnam? Because this was the port from which they used to trade with the Nagas, Naga people. So these local histories are all over. There's lots of it. I mean, I could possibly write just the history of Kutch and write a thick oh, book sorry. on it. Um, uh, there's so much of it. And sadly, uh, as we urbanize and these uh, oral histories are being lost very, very quickly. So you're right. Somebody has to really get on with it and begin. Hmm. I mean, the style of uh, doing... Um, Stitch ships, for example, there's still people who know how to do stitch ships, but the last generation. Mm. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, the lady in the orange, please. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, talking about uh, stitch ships at the Dao, um, we know in the 8th and 9th century it was definitely made in the Arab world and in India. In terms, uh, and we know that both those countries, as you said, carried the trade. In the case of the Arab world, 
thanks to the Belletung shipwreck in Singapore, we know we have evidence of a Dao um, trading between the Tang China and Abbasid uh, in the Middle East. But have there been, and it's told us it's opened a whole new world, and we also know that Arabic was the lingua franca of shipping, not an at Indian language. At that point in time, so it depends point. on which point you're Yeah, at the eight, but, but what I want to know is that that shipwreck has created a whole new learning. Do we have, I've heard speculation of Indian shipwrecks, but never heard of an Indian shipwreck. Yes, you know? so this and is actually a major issue, uh, that they aren't, while, you know, there are a few drawings of it, and of course travelers mention these stitch ships all the time, no actual ship, uh, stitch ship from that time exists. There are still people who do them today, so you can actually find a modern, but nothing ancient. And this is a problem, partly because uh, maritime archaeology in India is basically non-existent. I mean, they've done some, very recently some people have done some work in off Dwarka, but that is pretty much the limits of it. Also off the coast of Mahabalipuram, some stuff has happened. But again, naval divers are being sent down and bringing up stuff which somebody looks at. Marine archaeology in India basically does not exist. Uh, there are two reasons for this. One is, of course, you know, no funding and the usual story. But there is actually another real problem. And that, you see, our coastlines, both sides, are still alive. And which means that they, there is continuous sand and silt being uh, transported up and down. So even if there is stuff in there, uh, it's very difficult, it gets silted up very, very quickly because the coastline is alive and changing. Um, you know, uh, many of the Indian ports tended to be in uh, river estuaries, again, got probably silted down. So if technology, radar technology or something turns up which allows us to look below the silt, it's possible we will find stuff. But um, as things stand, and of course, given we had a hot climate, so things deteriorate faster, but, you know, if things can be found in Singapore, in a, uh, maybe, maybe in India too. Mm. But, uh, you know, just to, to emphasize, I, I think the, 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 the importance of doing this kind of work and of developing a more regional, regionally focused uh, perspective on, on Indian history is, is really important. So, like you were saying, Kutch and the Gulf or, or the Malabar Coast in East Africa. Yeah. Or, th these open up a whole series of different ways of thinking about um, parts of India. Um, which we're not really paying attention to at the moment. Um, yes, in the front row and then the lady there, yeah. Uh, th thanks a lot, Sanjeev and Sunil. Fabulous again. Uh, and Darpan uh, Majumdar. Sanjeev, my question to you, if uh, are you a trained historian and if you are not, then what is your process of writing history? Uh, there are two things which, I mean, interest me. In fact, I was asking Sunil also is that that history is both factual, which is where you're looking at a data, especially genetics, and a lot of it comes from memory, which is constantly eroding and f uh, forming a certain shape and size. Uh, so w in your process of writing, where does the synthesis happen, and, wha and, and what do you leave and what do you select in the process when you write a book? So I think there are two separate questions, really. Um, no, I'm not a trained historian. Um, in fact, I didn't particularly even like history. Uh, so I very often joke that I write my histories as revenge. Um, so, no. Um, All you, historians write their histories as revenge. Revenge <laughs> against the, <laughs> what they had, they, they, were, they were subjected to in school. Um, but, you know, if you read my writings, you will see it's a mixture of all kinds of stuff. So, um, ge geography is very important, commerce is important, uh, genetics and those kinds of things. So, it is by its very nature, um, multidisciplinary, and I'm deliberately so. Um, so, you know, if it's economic history, well, the historians can write it, so can the economists. Um, I do a lot of work on urban design, and you'll read, you'll get a feel of that in many of my books, because I do talk about the evolution of cities, particularly in my previous book, not so much in this one. In my previous book, I do talk about evolution of geography and so on, uh, and so on. So, so I think anybody who's interested in the subject is willing to read widely, and look at the interconnections because that's the point I'm trying to do. Um, so I don't think it's, a, this is a generalist's job, so to speak, so I'm not too fussed about being a historian or not being a historian. Um, in any case, many great contributions are made to many fields uh, from people from outside. I mean, much of economics wouldn't exist uh, without mathematicians and engineers and so on. So that I'm not too fussed about. Um, as far as what to leave in and leave out and decide, very difficult <laughs> issue. Um, 
uh, and that is, uh, since I'm not writing uh, comprehensive histories, I'm writing um, popular history. So my job is really to tell a story and keep it moving without getting stuck in any one bit which is, and it's a difficult thing because if you research something, in fact very often you have written it down and then you have to edit it out, it's almost like deleting a child <laughs> because you put in effort to research it, write it, it and then it doesn't quite fit the story or it's a completely then, you know. So what I do is I take that and I cut it into, I have a, I have a place where I put all my rough work out. I know I'll never use it again but I sort of put it there and carry on. So it's very important to me that the story keeps moving fast because that's the audience I'm talking to. But I, I, yeah, I agree with you, it's a tough thing to decide what to leave and leave out. I, I may not use any more than 40, 50 percent of the material I collect. Okay. Uh, yes, you and, and, yeah, let's take that lady here in the blue shirt. Thank you. Uh, this is really a great book. Thank you for writing it. Uh, I was wondering, during your research, did you come across any uh, documents or any uh, group of people who've written about marine life? I mean, was that studied? Marine life? Yes. Okay. Was that studied at all? I mean, maybe something akin to uh, Charles Darwin's work? You know, were they looking at things that they found on their way? Uh, did they write about it at all? So I didn't write about marine life at all. Even though it's about the ocean, I've left out ocean creatures out of it. It's about human uh, experience mostly. Um, there are people who are writing about it and again, it's, there are bits and pieces now in scientific journals. So somebody has to, so uh, there's a gentleman called Pranay Lal who was here uh, day before yesterday. Historic records of marine life. Well, it depends what time frame you use. That's why I was going to talk about Pranay Lal because he is actually, a, he is not a trained geologist. His book is on, Indica is on the geographical and geological evolution and he, he pulls out fossils and all these things and by the way, um, many of these fossils are not along today's coastline. Some of them are high up in the Himalayas uh, because the geology and topography have changed so much. So, yes, there are interesting people writing about it but um, uh, there, I haven't myself read a nice popular book about the ma marine uh, evolution of marine life uh, along the Indian coasts. Uh, but as I said, this is a field that is opening up and many people will do many things. So you suddenly now have somebody who's written a book on the geological history of India. I'm sure somebody will write something like that. But yeah. it's a huge field open to many, many people. Maybe he knows somebody who's written Well, I would just say not specifically on marine life, but Sunil Amrit's work on the environmental aspects and the ecology of the Bay of Bengal is something worth looking at if you're interested in, in, in those areas. Okay, I'm going to stack questions together now because there are a lot of hands up and we're running short of time. So we'll take your question, sir, and then the lady in the third row there. Sanjeev, you're a big uh, believer in uh, the complex adaptive systems. So how do you see in the times to come the geography and technology impacting the history of, let us say, 21st century? I mean, what are the major factors that you think will influence the history in the days to come. I'm going to ask you to hold that for okay. a second, a response. And yes, if we can take the lady's question in the third, yeah. I, so I wanted to ask. Uh, is, uh, yes, I thought so you're. Together. Oh, no, together. Okay. okay. So I just wanted to ask that there are no uh, major Indian settlements towards east coast of Africa side. Majorly what we've talked about is towards the east side, Southeast Asia, etc. Nothing on the west side of India. Is there a specific reason for that? No, the, so there are actually in, uh, signs of Indians there, whether we call them settlements or not, but in fact, the very first mention of Indians outside of India, interestingly happens on the west side. Um, there, uh, there is uh, records of the Sumerians who mentioned settlements uh, or they call them villages of Meluhans living in and around uh, their Sumerian cities. And, um, uh, the very, very first mention of a person who is an Indian living in the West uh, or outside of India is uh, uh, in a court case where a Meluhan is fined um, for having broken the tooth of a local in a bar brawl. Um, so, but let me clarify, uh, they would have been Gujarati and not Malayalis, uh, which might of course explain prohibition, but but uh, yes, so, so there are, and similarly the island of Socotra, 
which is off the coast of uh, uh, Yemen. Um, it, its original name is Dweepa Sukhdara, which is where Sokotra comes from. And there are uh, caves and other places on that island, including a very famous cave called Hok, where there are um, inscriptions in Brahmi and other things along the wall. So there are, uh, yes, Indians did go west too. And in fact, there were Indian merchants and astrologers, etc., all the way in Rome. So did, did you want to address the ah, complex? Yes, sorry, yes. Very, very Excuse briefly. Me, I yes, just sorry. had a request. Yes. Um, do not deprive us of all your uh, little tidbits of research, even if they don't fit into a coherent book. Yeah. So kindly uh, make a blog or something of uh, the stuff you've researched, which you think you not, will not uh, be able to fit into a book. Okay, I, well, I do occasionally write them as articles and stuff, but yeah, I mean, there's such a lot of material I need to get down and do that, but thanks for the suggestion. Okay. But I was going to Very go to the, the one on um, complex adaptive systems. Um, you see, one of the, uh, the, the point about complex adaptive systems, those who are not familiar, the idea, it's derived from chaos theory, and the idea is that history uh, flows by the complex uh, interactions between multitude of factors. It can be individuals, it could be technology, geography, social forces, in all kinds of economic forces. But this, the key to understand this is that this is not simply adding up all these influences. So, it is about the unpredictable and indeterminable interactions between these forces. Therefore, one of the key factors of this is that history is not predetermined in any way. Uh, and two, that you cannot take any individual factor and try and predict its outcomes. Um, now, so when you're talking about technology or any other factor, uh, yes, in retrospect, you can make a grand proclamations, but in prospect, one of the problems with this theory is uh, one of the things that it says is that expect the law of unintended consequences to take uh, a big uh, effect uh, because while you may say that these, in, in, uh, you know, technology, let's say, uh, very fast movement of people, let's say, happens in the Indian Ocean, the impact of that politically may be completely different. So even though you can move very fast, but because there is a reaction to it politically or militarily or something, in fact, the movement of people actually goes down, not up. So, this is one of the points about complex adaptive system, that there is no linear way of thinking of history. It's all about all kinds of influences and very often going off into random tangents. Yeah, I, I would say that it's a, it's a, if you like, a method or a precept that all good historians uh, would follow. Yeah. Uh, and particularly the unintended is. I think we're pretty much out of time. Um, so yeah, we I, are. yeah, we are. And so. you have to catch a flight. Right, I do. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you, Sanjeev. And thank you for the questions as a well. A great <laughs> round of applause for yeah. Sanjeev and Sunil for such informative and intimate session. I'm sure you all have gotten 100% of their attention. Thank you. Thank you for being here.